Could the mass slavery of millions of people or even the Holocaust happen today? We'll try to answer this question on Talking with Henrietta, coming up next. I'm Henrietta. Welcome to the show. World history is marked by mass genocides, mass enslavements, wars, and countless unthinkable traumas that human beings inflict on one another. But are there any kinds of programs or activities going on globally within countries or between countries to prevent the worst of human history from repeating itself? On this show, I'll talk with two members of a global organization facing history and ourselves, who will discuss the organization and the work that they are doing to educate young people to make informed and compassionate choices. To my left is Jack Weinstein, who is the San Francisco Regional Director of Facing History and Ourselves. Prior to assuming his position in 1997, Jack served as a teacher and staff development specialist for the Milpitas United Unified School District for 18 years. Susie Richardson is seated on my right. Susie serves as a trustee on Facing History and Ourselves as San Francisco Bay Area Advisory Board. She has also served as a member and as the president of the Palo Alto Unified School District's Board of Education. Well, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. As you heard, I mentioned the Holocaust, mass enslavement. Are those things, the type of events that could happen today? Unfortunately, yes. And terrible things are happening all over the world today. And kids are suffering and families are suffering, people are suffering close to home and around the world. On the scale of the Holocaust? Well, you look at the deaths, you look at what's going on in the Congo and Somalia, bad things happening. Jack? Well, you can look at uh, just in the last few days, it was the 20th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide in which over 800,000 innocents were slain. And uh, it happened over a period of about three months. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a modern day genocide. And there are unfortunately corollaries to it in a lot of other places in the world. So yes, the answer is yes. These things are not only possible, but they happen in various scales and in, in various locations and for various reasons. But at the root of all of it, all of it is it is about inhumanity and a blindness to what other people can bring to the world. And um, it needs to be addressed educationally and otherwise. So Susie, um, Jack just said at the root of it. Uh, what do you think is at the root of, of the types of and we could call them tragedies. You know, I think that that's something that if we knew, we would, they wouldn't happen anymore. Uh, I remember hearing one facing student, facing history student talking about her experience. She was actually in conversation with Elie Wiesel, and she was posing to him the question of whether these activities are part of human nature. Um, she and Ellie, who is Ellie? For the audience, those who may not so know. So Elie Wiesel is the author of more than 35 books. He is a survivor of Auschwitz uh, and uh, eventually Buchenwald uh, concentration camps. Uh, he is, uh, in some people's estimation, one of the foremost spokespeople for uh, addressing genocide and issues of human rights in the world today. He's a um, Nobel Peace Prize winner who's still active on the world stage. And he's a voice of conscience. Uh, in our in our society today, and I interrupted. Sorry. Well, I mean, oh, I I think I'll leave that story. As, well, I'll no, finish go that. Ahead. Yes. Well, she was saying that she went to a school where all the kids looked a lot like her. They had the same complexion. They had the same intellectual interests. They had similar families. It was a very small school, and yet she was mercilessly bullied, 
and she was trying to understand wh what is it that makes people tend to, to, to identify somebody and then act in uh, inhumane ways. Did she get an answer? She did not. Uh. <laughs> but in our educational work, we are m as interested in the ability for people to ask the questions and reflect on what they think as we are on what some answer might be from a, an expert. And we think that the power lies in the opportunity to reflect on our own choices and our own behaviors and on history as a, a set of lessons that we can learn from. So that when this child asked that question, the answer that came her way in conversation wasn't a pat answer. It wasn't something you'd find in a textbook. But in, a sense, in essence, it was a, an answer about the idea that anything that a human being can do is part of human nature. So we are all capable of angelic or beastly behavior. And that then it's a matter of choice making. Well, it's so sad when you think, reflecting on what you've just now mm -hmm. said, anything that we can do is a part of human nature. I mean, we are human beings, but it's sad to think that there are such depths to which we can go as human beings. But I think that what I've come to believe is that through education, we can make each other aware of, of points of danger, what propaganda can do, what happens when you start. Uh, in Facing History, we really, one of the things we look at is the power of labels. And when you start labeling people, it in a sense gives permission to other people to behave in inappropriate ways because that person is something. And we, we really challenge kids to think about that. And we challenge kids to think about concepts like we and they. Me and calling and you. people wetbacks or gooks or dinks or it's it's to kind of put them in a corner as if mm -hmm. they're not human. Mm -hmm. Nomenclature counts. If you if you can name it, you can categorize it, and you can label it. Um, you can choose to do that for a variety of reasons. For some people, that's a survival skill. We all go through life doing that in order to understand our surroundings and. Our, 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 uh, the, what we have to navigate in the world. But we can choose to use that information for positive or, or negative uh, results. And education is an opportunity for people to make wiser choices based on other people's experiences. As educators, if we didn't believe that change was possible, why would we ever enter a classroom? Sure. Now, having said all of that, we have a video uh, about facing history yep. and ourselves that will give us some context. Yep. In fact, we have two along the way. And uh, I'll let the, the crew tell me when we're ready to see the first one. So if we're ready. I decided to start with this one. Dear teacher, I am a survivor of a concentration camp. My eyes saw what no man should witness. Gas chambers built by learned engineers, children poisoned by educated physicians, infants killed by trained nurses, women and babies shot and burned by high school and college graduates. So I am suspicious of education. My request is, help your students become human. Your efforts must never produce learned monsters, skilled psychopaths, and educated Eichmanns. Reading, writing, arithmetic are important only if they serve to make our children more human. The first time I read this letter, I thought about my education in Memphis. I thought about how I could sit in a civics class across the street from the zoo. And the zoo said at one entrance, colored day only on Thursday and the others, no whites on Thursday. And I'm in a civics class with the ability to get an A on a Bill of Rights exam. What's going on here that the teacher never talks about that? A lot of history has been hidden from us. I'm presuming it's because we can't handle it. Facing history provides the tools in order for us to face the history and actually discuss the matters in a proper manner. I am empowering my students to recognize that they have the ability 
and the obligation and the responsibility to take charge of their communities, to hold their politicians responsible, to make sure that they vote in every election. Facing History is a global organization and it's reaching teachers in all different environments and each of those teachers are able to affect lives in their classrooms every single day. I was in South Africa and had the opportunity to observe teachers and students there using Facing History to allow students to confront the past of apartheid and the struggle against apartheid. If you believe in hope and in the prevention of violence and ultimately the prevention of genocide, you have to make educated policymakers. Being part of Facing History kind of made me see that it's not always about where I want to go in life and what I need to do to get money or to be successful. That is also taking some time to give back. If we could expand Facing History and the curriculum and the way that we teach the curriculum to all the schools across the country, across the world, it would change the world. You know, it's interesting. I was, I was thinking about how I often explain facing history to myself and to others. And I think facing history is an opportunity for teachers and students to flex their moral muscles. So they're not, so that students, or we as human beings, are prepared to, um, to deal with the dilemmas that come our way. Life is complicated. Um, that video was Margot Sternstrom, who is the founder of Facing History. She founded it when she was teaching middle school, uh, now 38 years ago. And she said early, or I heard her say early on in my involvement with Facing History, is if the only thing we do is make history messy, we will have accomplished something. Because I think that the way we teach history today is as if, as if it's orderly and there's a cause and there's an effect and you can simply march along the timeline. And there's nothing orderly about what's happened. Well, I'm thinking there is order in terms of a sequence of events, do you think? There's a, but events are created by people. Making it, choices. No. Yes. It, it's very interesting. In that video, Margo said that the Holocaust was caused by educated engineers who built the camps, by educated people who mm -hmm. gave the orders. And she said, we're about making people human. Now, we just now talked about the depths to which mm -hmm. humans can go. So someone would say, but these were all educated people involved in. So what's at stake is the definition of what it means to be educated. And the type of education. And the type of education one has. And that is something that we have an opportunity to have an impact on through Facing History's work. Now, it was just now talked about to flex the moral muscle. Yeah. Was it that these people weren't flexing their moral muscles? It's a complicated I question, right? Uh, the, the German, um, model of education during the Holocaust was very shaped by the politics of the era. Uh, teachers in Nazi Germany took a Nazi loyalty oath in order to keep their jobs. People um, organized curriculum so that if you were a 14-year-old boy in a math class, your mathematics problems were often about the trajectory of artillery that would be meant to, you know, kill the enemy. Young women were segregated in German schools so that they were learning how to be the mothers of a master race. They were learning homemaking skills more than they were learning critical thinking. Mm. So education was a political endeavor and people were making choices at a very high level in, in that situation about how to shape their society using the tools of education, I should say misusing the tools of education in order to achieve a very particular kind of set of goals. So I what's, yes. I, I mean, and I think there was a lot of um, false science created. Um, there was, there were ideas that you could measure g the heads of a, of a person and if it was the but circumference. Is it eugenics or? Is yeah. Well, like, eugenics yeah. is a whole another piece that we um, definitely address in our, our um, yeah. American Civil Rights un units um, 
and in science classes. But, but what but. is a Jew? In, in Germany, it was somebody who had a nose that was a certain length and a head that it was a certain size. You know. Uh, but the Germans had been known for producing some of the world's best known philosophers mm -hmm. and scientists, mm -hmm. and there was a long tradition, supposedly, of education. And so you talked about it being mm -hmm. used politically. Is it being used in places politically today? Surely it is. There's no doubt that it is. The, the, the wars in this society, the intellectual thinking, the spectrum of ideas about what the purpose of education should be is always something that, that uh, uh, people are wrestling over. Uh, what's the purpose of education in America today? Is it to produce a workforce? Is it to produce a critical thinking, uh, a set of people who can think critically and analytically? Is it, should it about be about? what? Well, uh, 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 that's the question, and, then, and that is part of the debate that's going on in American education today. Uh, and there are a lot of different points of view about it, and they show up in a lot of the policies that are, that are about American education today. Is it a political decision that in many countries in the world, uh, girls can't go to school? Yes. It sounds like a political decision to me. It sounds like education being used politically. Yeah, but you know, you said a word that's very powerful. You talked about moral muscles. Now, these people, in, uh, I shouldn't say these mm. people, but the people in other countries who believe that women should stay home, they would say they're flexing their moral muscles. So who defines the morality and what is moral? So when I talk about flexing a, a, a moral, preparing or your, your moral muscles, if I go to the gym I, and, and I'm lifting weights, I'm preparing to be able to pick something up that's heavy, theoretically. And so when I say that we want kids to be able to flex their moral muscles. They want, we want them to be able to be prepared to, to make difficult decisions. In a certain way? No, absolutely not. So if they're not going to make decisions in a certain way, they could very well participate in an event like the Holocaust. So what type of education is facing history and ourselves giving students so that they don't participate well, in events we're, we're like certainly We're certainly not morally neutral at facing history, nor is American public education neutral. We are empowered by the state frameworks and by the e expectations of the society codified in the education code to teach toward a certain set of ideas about uh, what it means to be a participatory member of society. We value that. Those rules are codified in the, in the policies of elected officials, in the policies of school boards, um, we value community service, we value positive affirmative participation, we value the opportunity to say we don't deny the, um, the history that we know, uh, we affirm the opportunity for people to make choices about how they participate in a spectrum, but within the rule of law, within the opportunities to make a contribution, those are values that we don't have to be neutral about in society. Uh, any more than we have to be neutral about whether people should stop at a red light and on I the think, street. And we value self-respect. Yeah. And, and tied to that, we value the idea of other people respecting other, someone else's space, someone else's choices. Now, when you talk about history, it's said that history is made by the victors. Mm -hmm. So what history that's that, facing history? Well, we... we love the opportunity to honor multiple perspectives. So we use the perspectives of people. It's important for children who are studying about what's happening in, a, in another place to read the voices of people that are there from a variety of positions. It's important for people to understand that they can apply what they know already, what their families have taught them, what they've learned in their society to question uh, what they may hear. Um, it's important for young people to have a spectrum of ideas presented to them, but, but within the opportunities that the education code and that the state frameworks prescribe after a long period of opportunity to shape those ideas around the norms and the expectations of the society in which they live. And um, you know, that, that there's always an opportunity to flex their muscles in a facing history classroom, we want them to ask critical questions. We want them not to be satisfied with 
the topical answers. We want them to know that the sources they might go after have, have to be credible um, uh, along a rubric of how you dis describe what a credible source might be. We want them to use primary sources. We want them to hear the voices of multiple people uh, as they learn to move forward in the world. You know, I think if you look at our work in South Africa, it's, you, you can get some insight into that, the answer to that question. So here you have just a major change with um, apartheid falling. And you've got this situation where you've got apartheid in the building of a civil society. That's, that's a history that's being made. It's a, it's a history that the ramifications and, and the progress is, is now. And so do you wait until you have enough perspective to teach it? Can you wait? Can you wait to, you know, who's going to write the history? The history isn't complete at this point, this critical history. So Facing History was invited in to work with um, right. South Africans at the university in, in um, Cape Town and develop a way that South African students could consider where what had happened and where they were and where they might be going. And one of the tools of that consideration was comparing and contrasting elements of apartheid in the building of a civil society that what ha to what had gone on in Germany. You know, as, as you talk, I was thinking, what is it that causes people to, to act like to act inhumane. And I think there is fear. There might be scarcity. Absolutely. Um, insecurity. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking we have scarcity now, you would think, around us. So and We have hate crimes around us. Really? Are they ever justified? Hate crimes? Hate crimes are never justifiable. Those, those they might are... be explainable. They might be able to be deconstructed you might be able to come to some understanding of how they evolved, but they're never excusable. Given people's fears, given people's insecurities, um, given scarcity, given all of the things that make people afraid, the differences among us, you're saying things like that are never, never justifiable. Well, actually, uh, I'm, I would be curious about wh what that conversation would sound like in a classroom of 35, 15-year-olds who had been studying um, either apartheid in South Africa or the Holocaust or the American Civil Rights Movement or the history of Jim Crow. Um, I, would, I would love to put that question, that rather than answer it, and this is vintage facing history, I may have an answer as an individual that I believe or even, you know, I may have a set of ideas in my own head, but my role as an educator should be to help other people, other students especially, come to clarity in their own thinking about those ideas. And that's a practice field for democracy, for civil discourse, for agreeing to disagree, for thinking together and being allowed to change one's mind with new information evolving. I, I would love to take that question to a group of 15-year-olds here in Palo Alto and see what the spectrum of ideas might be and have them explaining their perspectives to each other and then stop them in the middle and say, has anyone heard anything that's especially interesting that relates to a point of view that they didn't hold five minutes ago? What was that? What will you do with that? Does anyone want to change their position on the spectrum of ideas as a result of this conversation? That's the kind of education that I'm looking for. And, and that's what we train teachers to be able to do more readily than they might if they were lockstep walking through a textbook on the way to a high stakes standardized test. That's the kind of moment we want to see in classrooms more and more over time. And if you do take a question like that and present it to the students, please let me know. I would love to yeah. get the feedback. And it would be great if we could even do it here. I think those things happen That's facing right. history, history yeah. classrooms all the time. All the time. I would think and so. facing history is when really difficult things happen, particularly uh, affecting students that are in the news, um, facing history teachers are often the, the, the resource in their school to have difficult yeah. conversations. 
at nine eleven during nine eleven. I mean, Jack can talk about mm -hmm. being in Fremont mm -hmm. and, and what was needed to bring people into conversation. Jack, remember that because we're going to see another video, I and afterwards remember. we'll <laughs> talk <you>. about Great. <laughs> being in Fremont okay. after nine eleven. So I think we're ready for the other video. Terrific. We all have these elements within us. The ability to be a perpetrator, bystander, or upstander. You have a choice, but how do you learn to make complicated choices? Facing history in ourselves teaches students to think for themselves and to widen their perspectives. Why is that so important? Because people make choices, and choices make history. We begin by acknowledging that history is the human story. And to understand it, we must first understand ourselves. A facing history class might start by asking a student what shapes who you are as an individual and as a community. An identity chart is one way to look at this. So what is facing history's identity? For starters, we're a global education organization. From disturbing lessons of the Holocaust and other genocides to struggles for civil rights from Birmingham to South Africa, we trust students to wrestle with complex moments in human history and work to help them understand the range of human behavior. And through those studies, we seek to combat racism, anti-Semitism, prejudice, and stereotypes. And because we know that the lifeblood of democracy is active, informed citizens, we help young people become upstanders. To accomplish this, we provide teachers with professional development through workshops, seminars, and online learning, and mentor them throughout their careers. We create teacher resources such as lesson plans, publications, media, and more. Those teachers then reach three million middle and high school students worldwide. Facing History gets results that have been documented in more than 100 studies. 93% of Facing History students are more likely to recognize the dangers of racial or religious stereotyping. 83% are more likely to help if they see someone being bullied. And more than half of Facing History students are more apt to get involved in their school, community, or world. So what happens in a Facing History classroom to achieve such transformational results? Well, it's taught with a high standard of academic rigor, and there's lots of interaction. But the key to our success is in our approach to learning. Allow us to illustrate. Lesson one, we promote creative solutions. Connect these nine dots with four lines and don't lift your pencil. If you're like most people, you'll work within the box created by the dots. But to find the solution, you have to think outside the box. Facing history students are encouraged to think outside the constructs that have been created by norms, stereotypes, and dogma. Lesson two, we teach students to think critically and independently. In a famous study, seminary students were sent to another building to give a talk about the Good Samaritan. Along the way, they encountered a man slumped in an alleyway. Overall, 40% stopped to offer help. When the students were told beforehand that they must hurry, only 10% stopped to help, and these were good people. Facing history students are taught to question their actions or inaction and to not blindly follow instruction. Lesson three, we encourage questions and deep investigation. Pol Pot, Hitler, Stalin, Talat Pasha, Idi Amin, is it enough to know the names of the dictators? Or do we dig deeper to determine the climate and causes that led to their rise to power to avoid future crimes against humanity? Facing history students understand that while it's important to know facts and figures, change comes from asking questions and applying historical knowledge. So we've all seen the terrifying rise in hate groups and how the world is becoming increasingly polarized. And yet, we rarely learn civics, how to participate in communities, understand one another, or simply how to be more humane. Facing History does this. Right now, 30,000 teachers use Facing History materials in their classrooms. Three million students each year are impacted. Impressive. To scale, here's what that looks like. If we want to create a world of thinking, involved, empathetic people, Facing History's reach is going to have to look a lot more like this. Help us.
Tell people about Facing History. Tell every educator you know. Tell your colleagues, friends, and neighbors. Donate. With more money, we reach more teachers and students. Be generous. The greater Facing History's presence, the greater the opportunity we all have of living in a more just and humane world. The world needs Facing History, and we need you. Any questions? Yes, I have some more questions. <laughs> I thought you would. I knew you would. And we'll talk we about like your Fremont. But sure. before we do, in the video we just saw how facing history and ourselves gets results. What type of results was the narrator talking about? So the, the film references over 100 studies that have been done of facing history's work over the past 37 years. Some of the more recent studies have actually been double-blind studies by outside agencies, not done by people from within Facing History's network of connected educators. And some of those studies have indicated an increased historical understanding, an increase in student engagement, and really importantly for the structures of education in this country at this time, I think um, teacher efficacy, the sense that teachers who are deeply connected with Facing History, um, in these studies, it's indicated that they feel an increased sense of efficacy of their own work. And that's a very important measurement because it means that they may be more likely to stay with their work rather than moving out of the field. We don't know so that that's the case. So you're saying that the teachers themselves feel more satisfied that's in terms of what they're doing. More, more connected to the subject matter they teach more convinced that the subject matter leads to the kinds of results that they would like to see as educators, more connected to their students, and they derive the benefit of working with students that are more likely to be engaged and deeply moved by what they're studying. So what does he mean, and I could very well ask Jack, but I'll ask you, <laughs> sure. Susie, when he talks about student engagement. Oh, well, I think that if you walked into a Facing History classroom, you would probably not find kids dozing off in the back of the room. I think that so often in a classroom, the, the model is for teachers to pour what they know into the students, you know, like open your head and here it comes. Um, and Facing History teachers believe that students, that students should really work with the information, work with each other, and that they should find their own answers. Ah. So the answers might not very well be the answers that lead to human compassion. I mean, if people are going to think, think for themselves, mm -hmm. they can come up with all kinds of conclusions. Well, I mean, I think that that's true, but there's a frame. So I'll give you an example. Um, in the Holocaust, you know, here we are, you're in Germany. Um, I'm in Germany, let's say. I'm, I'm, I'm um, Protestant, I have three kids, and I live in a village, and my next door neighbor is Jewish and has three kids. Do I take them into my house and hide them to protect them, putting my, my own kids at risk? What kind of relationship do you have with your neighbor? <laughs> We're friends, we've, we've lived next door for 10 years. But, but the question is, something that we might call the what is your universe of obligation so am the, I my brother's keeper it's exactly that question it is it is exactly yeah. that question but you have to you have to um, par, uh, put that with the question of what's your responsibility to keeping your own children safe yes and exactly the, the whole point of that question is that there's not a right or wrong answer oh so what you're saying is, if I feel that an SS officer or whomever will come to my house and threaten me that if I know something about my neighbor, if I don't give that up, then we're in danger. But it also complicates the terrain. If we leave that question, the simple question, and we don't speak at the same time about what the other options are, about what the other choices are on the way, it's not an either or. It doesn't, it doesn't always have to be uh, that you, you stop your car in the middle of the night to help someone who's along the side of the road or you're a bad person. It could be that you have the choice to use your cell phone to call for help. 
and without putting yourself in danger on that lonely country road where you don't know who that person is who's stranded by the side of the road. It doesn't always have to be an example about uh, a situation of genocide or a situation of war. It can be about everyday situations. Where um, I don't always yeah. have to stop for a homeless person That's to give correct. them help. That's correct. You may decide that the, the, the most important way you can um, be um, helpful is to be involved in your community in a way that prevents homelessness. Or it may be that you have a different, a different way of providing aid. I, I can tell you that I don't normally reach into my pocket and provide cash to um, every needy person I may run into on the street. But I, I have been known to say to somebody as I've walked by, I will not give you cash, but if you walk with me into that pizza parlor two doors down, I will put money on the counter to make sure you get a meal. Would that be acceptable to you? And why should you do that? I mean, I think that's what it... We can't always do it, right? And we, why should I feel that I'm my brother or my sister's keeper? So I would say that I don't get to tell you that. But what I want you to notice is that there are people who have needs. And I want you to be faced with... I, I want you to think about it. I but just, they're not my needs. So you don't have... You get to choose whether you meet their needs or not. But I think that if we are a society where people are moving through blindly and not making choices, I can't tell you what your choice should be. But I think that if we are going to be a civil society, we need to, we, we need to recognize that we live in relation to other people. Well, do you know, you might not specifically say what the choice should be, but I think there's certain implied assumptions. Well, there, there may be. Uh, For example, if you talk sure. about flexing your moral muscle, if you talk about not letting the Holocaust or mass slavery or inhumane conditions occur, well, then I think you're saying that there are certain things that we need to do as individuals, that I, we need to care or we need to be more compassionate. So I think there is a goal there. Certainly there's there, a goal there. Uh, and okay. there's a goal. Certainly, certainly. That, that is a goal, and, and I think that a very clear goal is that the kids will come out and, and they, will, they will participate in their society. They will, at the very least, they will vote. That they will say that we are a member of society. And we believe, I believe, and I think that one of the things that appeals to me about facing history is that we, I think we, I can say, you can disagree with this, that we believe that society depends on people making informed choices. Well, I think not only informed choices. I mean, it could be informed like there is so much food. Um, well, food is expensive. I have money to pay for it. I know how much it is. If other people don't, that's their problem. That's information, and that's an informed choice. But I guess it has to go beyond having information and how you act on that information. Well, the record of the, the human record is available to us, not every human record, but many. We can learn from the experiences and choices that other people have made. I live for the idea of putting moral and ethical decisions in the hands of young people, not so that they'll make the decision that I might make, but so that they have a practice field for making decisions mm -hmm. about the way they're going to walk through life. And it may be that that young person who's sitting in, in a classroom has very few opportunities in his home life or in his community to be in those kinds of conversations, to be on that practice field for making those kinds of conversations uh, part of their lives. And in a facing history classroom, they have that opportunity. And we believe that that is a forward step for young people, that they can s not just sit back and listen, but perhaps really think about what they're hearing in a way that might give them new options to think about, about the way they choose to walk in the world. And we trust them. Young people have the possibility and the capability to change, to, to, to flex their uh, intellectual and their, their compassionate muscles in a way that make them better people. I just met a young woman uh, at a school that we work with on a regular basis who upon discovering uh, for herself uh, on her own web research 
that human trafficking is a major problem, decided to make it a focus for her own research, for her own project, for her own involvement in the community. She's now established a website where she's informing other young people using credible sources, which she learned to do in school, how to tell what's credible and what's not, what's acceptable information and what's not. And she's actually making a difference. She's actually deciding. She's pointing people in the direction of this information in a way that might empower somebody to make a different level of contribution in their society. She would never have done that without school. She would never have done that without a teacher who had the opportunity to teach her about how to go on the web safely, how to know the difference between the endings of the websites that are credible and the ones that are advocacy-based that may have a point of view that is already skewed. She's learning skills. She already has the disposition to make a difference. Now she has the opportunity to make a difference. And that difference might be intellectual or it might be actual service. You know, I, I, you, you, you're pushing in a certain direction where I sort of have this feeling that you don't really believe. But <laughs> it, it gives me this, I, I come up with this image of, of sort of people, robot people moving past each other on conveyor belts. Uh, it's not so far-fetched. Our cars are learning to drive themselves. Um, you know, we have our machines. We walk down the street with our machines. And I, I do have a point of view that human interaction is essential. Um, you know, why do you do this show? So I can share different perspectives on the issues with the viewing audience. And that's why we teach. That's right. So that kids can think about different perspectives. Because we believe, like I assume you believe, that different perspectives matter and that there's not one mold of what's right and wrong, but that that finding your own sense of right and wrong and acting upon it, it does matter. Yes, it does matter. Uh, but as one person said in the first video that we saw, she said, it's not just about me and mm -hmm. what I think. It's about the world. And I noticed you mentioned mm -hmm. making a difference. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I am kind of pushing because, and I'll admit it, <laughs> I am pushing because there is a goal in mind, and I'm thinking there is an evolutionary goal in terms of human behavior. Where do we want it to go? We talked about the depths of human action. Mm -hmm. If we're going to avoid the Holocaust or mass slavery again, then there's, certain, there's a certain direction for mm -hmm. human evolution to go. Would you agree with that? Well, you know, I mean, I would think that there, are, there were, would be, if you look at the Holocaust, there would be lots of ways that you might avoid the Holocaust. You might have avoided the Holocaust if Germany hadn't gotten itself in the economic situation that it had gotten in. But even if it had, we talked about mm -hmm. is there justification for uh, hate crimes? Just because there is an economic problem doesn't mean that you no. turn to uh, killing other people. Right. Yeah, right. but we don't have control over that. And, and, and we have control over our individual actions. Exactly. We have control as a community in terms of what we can do to influence other people within our community. In terms of what we tolerate or what we advocate for. So when you're talking about different perspectives, isn't it important what those perspectives are if you're going to have people acting within a community so that they're not um, involved in inhumane actions against other people? Certainly. Sure. Certainly. So it's very important for young people to know that there are causes and there are effects. There are there are things that are explainable about the way people fail to live up to what they're capable of as human beings. There are things that cause people to fall. There are things that cause people pain, and that pain can be translated into misdeeds or uh, into anger or into jealousy or into rage. 
And you know, I just heard an interview on NPR not too many days ago uh, with a former perpetrator in the Rwandan genocide. And he was found guilty in Rwanda of having murdered some of his own neighbors, people that he had had dinner with, you know, months earlier, people whose, whose children played with his children at an earlier time. And he, he couldn't really explain why he fell into, um, um, you know, uh, the moral quagmire and the failure represented by the Rwandan genocide. The labels, the ethnic labels that, that were at the root of that genocide became far more magnified for him. And they did so not because of uh, one day or, or, or um, uh, one person's teaching, but because they evolved in that direction, because the pressures that were on him, he succumbed to. And the question for people like that, the question for perpetrators of violence generally, especially in organized mass violence, is how could they, those pressures have been ameliorated or avoided? How could a different level of education or a different level of interaction with people have, have mitigated some of those things? And the other piece of it is that there were other neighbors in that situation who didn't succumb to those uh, influences. And, the, and they need to be spoken about as well. How, how, where did they find the courage and the compassion in order to make decisions that we would now uh, appreciate and look back on with, with admiration? How did that happen? And when you put those dilemmas in front of young people and you give them the language to talk about courage and compassion alongside human failures, you're empowering them to think in a different, at a different level about their own set of actions. You can have them reflecting on where in their own lives have they been silent when they should have stood up? Where in their own lives have they had an opportunity to uh, make a difference on the what, what in a historical sense would be the right side of and history? And even where in their own lives have they been treated in a way, you know, a lot of kids are treated in ways that they have to sort of stuff inside. Yeah. And so, I mean, one of the early or sort of exercises, I think you could call it, that, that can happen in a facing history student uh, classroom is that they will do personal maps. How do they, they'll write down, how, how do they see themselves? You know, I see myself as um, aging, uh, short, uh, Jewish, uh, invited to a TV show on the Facing History board, uh, lift, uh, somebody who likes to lift weights and dance. You know, I could go on and on. A mother, a grandmother, um, somebody else might see me completely differently. And so the kids write how they see themselves. They, they really think about that. And then they turn the paper over and they write about how they've, they've been seen. How they believe they've been seen. That's a very powerful exercise. Why? Because they have to start thinking about whether they can, what, who decides who they are. Are they, I think that all of us, well, certainly I have, I think most of us have been in a situation where we've let other people define us and we buy into that definition. And complicating people's identity is a protective, um, it's a protective cloak against making simple judgments. You know, uh, I am more than meets the eye. You are more than meets the eye. If all I am is what someone thinks I am, they can put me in a in a box, they can put me in a category that they can decide to make a judgment about. But once they understand that I am more complicated than that, once I understand that you are more complicated than that, it makes it much more difficult to make negative judgments about someone when you know that there are things that you don't, you don't know what you don't know. But some people wouldn't care whether you're more complicated than that or not. But it's a so, question of what so, our students care. So, but wait a moment. Okay. The soldiers in Vietnam, did they care whether the people defined as the enemy were more complicated than being gooks or dinks or whatever? So, so Wouldn't I, it I have, have been good if they had? I, I have to, but they were yeah. there to follow orders. So I have to respond to that because I'm a veteran. And in basic training, I was in basic training when we learned about the massacre at My Lai. I was in basic training. And I wrote about it as a reporter. Yeah. And, and 
it was a long time after My Lai before the, the knowledge of it became public. It, w it wasn't immediate. It wasn't a day after My Lai that the world learned about My Lai. It was some months some later. Months later. And I was a soldier in basic training at the time that that knowledge became public and we became aware of it. And one of the things that I remember most and that I appreciated most about my own service was that we had conversations about it as American soldiers. Our company commander brought us together and put us in a circle and we discussed, I was 19 years old, and we discussed what's the difference between a legal order and an illegal order. And what does this military system stand for? I'm not saying it happened for every soldier. I'm not saying that every person that ever was in the American military went through such conversations, but my company commander was a wise man. He had a group of 19 and 20 year old men, some of whom were going to be sent to Vietnam, to whom he asked that question. And we had a reasoned conversation about it. And it was clear to me as a 19 year old that I was expected if I wore the uniform and that if I were put into a war zone that I would be expected to make moral decisions, not just to blindly follow orders. That kind of education is a very important element. I want to put that question out to young people today. We can do it about what happened at Abu Ghraib. We can do it about what happened in many other places in the world. We can do it about um, the, the dilemmas that Romeo Dallaire faced uh, in Rwanda in not being empowered by the UN to interfere in the genocide against the Rwandans, you know, against the, against the Tutsis by the Hutu. We can look at those moral dilemmas and we can dissect them, we can deconstruct them. And as a result of doing that, we can complicate the thinking and the moral landscape on which our students are, are having, having to navigate their now, lives. Now, you said something um, that triggers another question. We can complicate. It's said that sometimes we have too many choices. <laughs> and when you're given one or two choices, it makes it all very simple. And maybe that's why it's easy for people to do certain things, because it's simple. They can follow orders. Mm -hmm. People don't like me because I act a certain way. Well, then, maybe I'll change my behavior so that they'll like me. What's, what's the advantage in having it complicated? I think we want young people, we want ourselves as well, to have the chance to develop what you might call a moral vocabulary, a morally philosophical vocabulary. Education is not just life as it's unfolding. It's a practice field for life. Where else do we get the opportunity to, to practice those conversations? And what habits of mind get formed when we have the opportunity to practice those conversations? Maybe when we are confronted with a moral dilemma and we are used to thinking about choice making, maybe we don't have to be uh, wildly analytical. Maybe we don't have to line up all our ducks in a row in order to pick the duck that we want you know, at that moment. Maybe because we've had that practice field, we, 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 our autonomic re, re, you know, responses can kick in and we can make better decisions by nature, by our very human nature, than we might have had we never had those opportunities within. And life is so full of choices. Yes, it is. And, and, and we can't do anything about that. I mean, we, unless we're going to, yeah. you know, sort of uh, live in a cabin in the woods, and that's a big choice. And even then, you probably have all sorts of choices yeah. that you have to make for survival choices. Um, you know, as we sat down here, we had choices of the glasses and the whatever. So what are the guidelines that you think young people should have to consider as they make those choices? Knowledge about when people have failed from their points of view, from, from our society's point of view, to live up to uh, what they consider um, an acceptable and human response to, to uh, situations and also what has been in place when people have been able to be their best selves. What has to be in place before uh, people can make that decision to be their best selves? You talked about something that had, hasn't come up and that's being a best self. What for you, Susie, is mm -hmm. being a best self? So, I, 
I think we must be on the same wave because I was just thinking about Albie Sachs, South African free, freedom, excuse me, freedom fighter, um, the first drafter of the South African Constitution, uh, a colleague. A confidant of Nelson com Mandela. Uh, appointed by Nelson Mandela to the Constitutional Court. And we can look at human beings like Albie and we can have models of what is someone's best self. Um, I was engaged in a conversation with Albie recently where he talked about forgiveness. He was, um, his, he, as I said, was a freedom fighter. He was uh, imprisoned in South Africa several times and finally felt that he had to leave. And so he was in Mozambique. He was followed by the South African secret police and his car was blown up. And one of the interesting pieces of that story is people have asked him how he felt when he w woke up in a hospital. And he said he couldn't have felt happier oh. because he, he knew in the work that he did that somebody was going to be after him and that he was putting his life on the line. And the fact that they'd blown up his car and he survived mm -hmm. was, was good news. Mm -hmm. And then he talked about forgiveness. The question was, do you forgive the person who blew up your car? And he talked, he said that in his mind, that wasn't quite the right question. Mm -hmm. That it wasn't about forgiveness because the complications of what, how the person who blew up his car came to blow up his car were so, uh, were, were things that he couldn't really know about. He didn't know those people. He didn't know what they'd gone through, why they did it. But he didn't want to carry the anger. Mm -hmm. And he could transcend rather than forgive that experience. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a person who to me is an example of a best self. And through Facing History, we have an opportunity to expose kids mm -hmm. to the stories and in many cases, the actual meeting of people right. like that so that they can have examples of people who live in that mold of best self. Well, we'll have to end it there. <laughs> end it, and I think that's a great place to end it yep. with being our best selves and striving for that. Yep. And I'd like to thank you for pleasure. being here with me, thank talking you. about great pleasure. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you for caring about our work. <laughs> to be our best selves and make the world a better place. And I'd like to yeah. thank our viewers thank for watching. Until next time.